you're listening to the Chorus One podcast, a show that covers decentralized networks and their impact on the evolution of automated and borderless economies. On this podcast, we invite pioneers and builders to discuss the decentralized protocols and projects they are working on. So hello everyone, welcome to the Chorus One podcast where we're joined today by Mike and Griffin, both from Fire Labs. So welcome both. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thanks, guys, for having us. So, also got Felix co-hosting the podcast with me today, and yeah, we thought we'd take the opportunity to invite uh, both Mark and Griffin to chat about Arcway, which is a protocol they're both contributing or core contributors to. I'm um, really excited to announce that we invested recently um, in Arcway, and also we'll be onboarding the network. So, yeah, we wanted to have both on today to talk about the current status of the network, how it's been going, and some nice use cases and applications as well as also to touch on potentially, I guess, how it differs from other platforms that might be similar in the cosmos. So yeah, guys, I guess, welcome to the show and it would be great to hear your background to start with and also a bit about how you're contributing to Aqua at the moment. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, I'll go ahead and start. Um, my background was was FinTech, uh, you know, software engineer, I ended up getting into the product side of things. Um, and ended up joining um, in crypto in 2015, and, and then eventually got connected with a company called uh, Consensus. I uh, was, you know, one of the early hires over there, and, and helped uh, build out a lot of product and tooling and offices, and playing a whole bunch of different roles and hats over there for for many years on the Ethereum side. Uh, and then left that and did some DeFi NFT stuff, and then um, ended up getting to the the Cosmos space a few years ago. Um, where we started uh, thinking about an IDA around a, a new blockchain protocol, and in this case, named Archway. So uh, just a little bit of background about me, Mike. Yeah, so first off, again, thanks, guys. Huge, huge fan of the yeah. podcast. So super excited to be to be chatting with you guys and catching up. Um, yeah, so I, I'm focused on ecosystem at Labs. Again, Labs being a core contributor to the Archway protocol itself. Um, I, I jumped into the space full time at the end of 2017 with a project called Loom Network. Uh, we were doing a lot of the early Ethereum scaling solutions, uh, early L2s, sidechains, Plasma, Plasma Cash. Did a lot around developer education. If you've heard of Crypto Zombies, that helped train up a lot of blockchain developers in and out of the Ethereum ecosystem. We built some dApps ourselves. Um, Loom, Loom was an interesting one. It was kind of like at the dawn of the application era of, of blockchains. And, and I would say it was like one of the first viable places to actually build dApps. Um, it's kind of wild to think back, you know, Axie Infinity, SoRare, Maker was doing some of their first multi-chain stuff there. But it was early days. Uh, the, you know, the market wasn't quite there. The developer community wasn't quite there. The users, 2018, 2019 were rough. Um, but but extraordinary experience nonetheless. Uh, first off, the, the first opportunity to to collaborate with none other than Chorus One, uh, helping us spin up one of the very early proof of stake chains back in the day. Uh, and then also, you know, Loom was a, a Tendermint based chain. It was it was basically Tendermint plus EVM, kind of the the Polygon model, a little bit before Polygon. Um, and so that was, you know, the initial exposure and foray into Cosmos, the stack and the community had been following along and interacting with Cosmos over the years and um, was just really excited about where things arrived finally with IBC going live a little more than a year ago. And like the grand vision became complete, that that holy trinity of the Cosmos SDK, Tendermint Core and IBC, and then starting to see actual IBC products launch at scale with like pretty sensational UX, things like osmosis. And so, um, so yeah, connected with Griffin uh, early last summer. Um, the idea of Archway immediately clicked for me, you know, this, this notion of a shared smart contract chain that lets people kind of on-ramp into the broader IBC universe. Um, and then what we're doing around the economic model really grabbed me, which I think maybe we'll dive deeper into as, as we chat here. Yeah, I'm curious, I guess, like a uh, first immediate question for me that would be cool to hear is like how you guys met and like came across each other. Um, and then also, so your team from memory was formed somewhat by the now known as Ignite. So yeah, how, did, how was the early initiation of your team and also how did you find each other? Yeah, so um, 
as you mentioned, we were, were Phi Labs is in the protocol is kind of incubated by Ignite, formerly known as as Tendermint. Uh, sometimes they do business as as all in bits, but um, yeah, as you know, Tendermint was one of the first, if not like kind of the core private company behind the Cosmos ecosystem, one of the large contributors. Now we're very thankful enough that there's. Um, you know, a lot of different software development companies contributing to the Cosmos ecosystem at this point. Uh, but um, I would say Ignite uh, is still, you know, one of the larger contributors in the Cosmos ecosystem still. Um, so we, we've been incubated by them. Um, you know, the idea started to form when we were looking at the broader landscape a little bit um, in the Cosmos ecosystem a couple of years ago. Um, we noticed, you know, like Cosmos has this vision of app-specific or self-sovereign chains, which basically means, you know, to build a custom use case and deploy that to your own custom chain, which is really a, a great vision and really excited about the founders and, and, and that vision of things. But the challenge we still had in the Cosmos space is, you know, we still weren't getting, um, you know, a lot of the DAP or application activity that we were seeing in other layer ones. For instance, we were missing NFTs and a lot of the DeFi DAPs and things like that. Um, and so what we wanted to do at uh, Ignite is basically incubate a smart contracting chain that would be a home to all these different, uh, you know, third party dApps and let them to at least build their applications on top of Archway. And then via IBC, the native bridge protocol, access all the other assets and liquidity throughout the Cosmos ecosystem. So Archway, in our view, is kind of like the, the on-ramp into the Cosmos space. And it's really a solution for folks that don't necessarily or aren't ready to build their own custom chain, but still want to build an application and get to market fast in the Cosmos ecosystem. And that's the role that Archway kind of plays. Um, yeah. Yeah, super interesting. I think, right, like there's a lot of work that needs to be done if you want to like launch your own chain in Cosmos. And I guess that barrier is very huge and Cosmos or like the smart contract kind of bridges that. I, I think that's a very nice strategy. I think, right, we even now when we record this, we just had the proposal uh, 69 on Cosmos Hub even to maybe include uh, Cosmos there. And of course, we have other smart contract chains like Juno and um, Agoric, maybe, I guess, kind of, it's not Cosmos, but it's another smart contract chain in Cosmos. Maybe, uh, can you expand a little bit how Archway is different from them or what it brings to the table that maybe these, these don't cover? Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, from our perspective, like, um, if you think about all the world's financial transactions and, you know, ideally we are all on the same mission of, you know, putting them on blockchains at the end of the day, decentralizing, you know, the traditional financial ecosystem. And so when you think about that market as a whole, it's a really, really large space. And so from our perspective, we think there's a lot of room for uh, different smart contract platforms to exist, uh, first and foremost. Um, and so, uh, and we think it's beneficial to the ecosystem, broader Cosmos ecosystem to have, uh, you know, different core contributors and folks contributing to a wide variety of different strategies with the ultimate goal of building and bringing in third party applications into the Cosmos ecosystem. Um, similar to what you were saying earlier, it's like, the, the trade-offs between building an app and your custom chain is like, if you're building a custom chain, it's very expensive. You got to get core developers. You got to get a strong validator set. You got to get the capital to secure the network. So it can be very costly and expensive to get to market. The positive is you get full customization over your network in your chain. Conversely, if you build a dApp, you know, it's much easier and quicker and faster to get to market, but maybe you have a little less customization. So um, first and foremost, we think there's the, the space is going to be so big. There's there's a lot of opportunity for us all to win here um, uh, in all the communities to do really, really well. Uh, the second thing what we really focused on was building inside uh, the community has been focusing on building this reward system inside the Archway protocol. Um, so historically, layer one blockchains will uh, incentivize uh, the network operators, typically in, um, you know, in a proof of work network that's miners, um, in a proof of stake network that's, that's typically our delegated proof of stake network that's validators. And uh, while we think that's really great for the start of first layer ones, we saw this huge um, 
shareholder that really wasn't being rewarded for their contributions to the layer one protocol. And in that particular case, that's DAP developers. And so Archway Protocol has redesigned the rewards distribution to not only share both the gas fees and inflation with just validators. What we do is we redirect a proportion of those rewards to the DAP developers that are building on top of the underlying network. Uh, and what that does is it basically aligns the layer one incentives directly with adapt developers building on top. Um, if you're a DAP developer right now and you're considering which chain to build on, like if you were to go to build on Ethereum today, um, yes, the ecosystem is very mature, the tooling and everything around it is very mature, but you know, you're bringing in users and activity to this underlying platform. But at the end of the day, you know, what value as you as a DAP developer are you receiving from the community and the network itself? And the only way you would basically receive a proportion of that value is if you were to like purchase ETH as a token yourself. Uh, and, and the problem is, you know, obviously you know, the latest market prices and things like that, um, you know, you have to basically buy it at a much, much higher price. The, the network itself, the platform itself is not giving back to you as a DAP developer in the same way that it's incentivized to run miners or validators. And so what we're doing, um, the community is doing on Archway Protocol is redesigning those economic incentives, taking a lot of what's happening at the DeFi layer and breaking that right at the layer one protocol itself and incentivizing those third party DAP developers to basically uh, build dApps on top of the network without necessarily having to go just directly to foundations or grant programs, et cetera. Um, once those rewards accrue on the network um, for that dApp developer, they can do whatever they want with those rewards. They can redirect it to their governance token holders. They can redirect it to a DAO. They can use it to subsidize gas fees, uh, redistribute those rewards to their LP providers and like a DEX. The options in com are completely configurable, completely up to um, the underlying um, DAP developer and what is in the best interest of their use case. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, important point, actually. So I guess like just to summarize, a lot of the rewards and you know in your network go to the people building on it and the ones that are actually bringing activity to the network. Whereas if you think about something like Ethereum, which has like ETH, like if I today build a new application there and I need ETH for any reason, like I'm paying a lot, lot higher price than people paid for it like eight years ago. Um, and I think that's really unique, like value proposition of Archway. Um, so I'm curious because like, if you think about Ethereum, for example, let's like think about Aave where, okay, so someone builds a protocol on Ethereum and then instead of like value accruing to ETH, they'll like release their own governance token and then like, oh, like their own token, whatever. And so that sort of actually detracts away from the value accrual of the base layer asset. I'm, I'm interested to hear, I guess, do you think that there will still be like governance tokens on Archway or do you think there's some chance that like there could be like a lot of applications that go live where they might not necessarily need a token and like some of it accrues back to uh, like Arch instead of like a, a, a token of the application itself? Yeah, we, we don't know for sure. It's kind of up to the DAP developer at the end of the day. So, um, you know, I, I would say governance tokens, you know, partly came around to decentralize the underlying protocols, but it was also a little bit of like a monetization strategy for the community and the participants in that layer, uh, in that DAP ecosystem. And um, on top of Archway, you can still launch a governance token and, for instance, redirect, um, you know, Arch native token streams back to the to the the governance token holders as a form of of distribution. Um, but we think like there's going to be new kinds of DAP models that emerge on top of Archway that weren't completely possible on top of Ethereum or any of the other layer ones by having a steady stream of payments and rewards coming into the um, DAP developer. Um, and so we're really excited to see what the DAP app community kind of comes up with, knowing that now maybe you don't necessarily need to just rely on a governance token. Um, and then with that being said, is like if you really do want a governance token and it's necessary for your protocol, like we see this reward system augmenting and supporting that because you know now you're not limited by just the amount of tokens 
um, in your distribution, you have a way to kind of replenish and continue to um, uh, replenish your treasury as a as a DAO or as a as a DAP developer. And so, we see this as a way to kind of augment and support uh, governance tokens, um, where you're not just completely limited by your token cap table that you've distributed via governance. So. Um, yeah, we're just really excited to see what happens. Um, and we might even start to see more traditional Web 2.0 like business models come on and build as dabs, knowing that there's this steady stream of rewards kind of coming in for um, that core community that's building and running that underlying dab. Awesome. Yeah, I think that seems to be like, would you say that's the core innovation of core USP of, of Archway? Is that like kind of correct? Yeah, I would say so for sure. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, a question that follows up from that, I, I do think that like maybe like some people will have thought about this too, right? This seems like so super interesting model, but it also maybe has like some issues potentially, right? Where how do you actually measure in practice what usage means, right? Like I guess we have yeah. the gas, the computation cost um, that a smart contract takes. But then of course, if we say, well, you're getting more of the rewards if you use more computation then that might lead to like a dab building like a super complex thing just to have you spend a lot of gas. Um, I guess the question would be, how does Arcway mitigate that? Uh, does it do that? Or um, And also like, what will that actually mean? Or what do you think it will mean for fees on, on Archway? Is it actually going to be a higher fee network potentially because of the system or... Um, yeah, I guess let's keep it. Yeah, it, you know, it's a really great question and we, we don't have all the answers. We're really excited for the community to, to come in and, and, and help us solve some of this. Uh, the, the core team, I would say, and a lot of the core contributors think about it from a, a market dynamics perspective. So on Ethereum, when um, you see a lot of dApps being forked and copied and then reiterated on and rechanged and reconfigured, right? to be more efficient and so forth. And so as a dApp developer, you could write a really inefficient smart contract and basically eat up more of the rewards, but then you're you're playing with the opportunity that somebody else kind of comes in and copies the code and writes a more efficient smart contract and basically offers the dApp solution at a much cheaper, maybe faster rate. And so um, there's probably gonna be some lock-in effects around like branding and things like that. But we don't think it's going to be a, a really strong strategy for dApp developers for the primary concern that somebody can come in and basically fork that contract and build something more efficiently. Um, what's also interesting about the protocol is like you don't have to build just like a full dApp. You can build components um, like financial components and the system actually rewards every component in every contract that is being called. So if you have a DEX that's built on top of Archway, for instance, and it's looking up the market price from an Oracle system, both the Oracle system smart contract will get rewarded and so will the DEX as well. So you can really start to build composable elements of contracts. And as long as somebody else is like reading and calling your contracts, you'll get rewarded yourself as well. So we think what will happen is like, in theory, that um, you know, more of these DAP components will get unbundled into more bite-sizable components that then are built up into larger and larger systems. Uh, and we think because of market dynamics, uh, folks won't be completely incentivized to just um, you know, burn through and make really inefficient smart contracts for the concern that somebody else can come in and do it much better, faster, and cheaper, similar to what we've seen with the wars on Ethereum and other layer ones. And I think you might have like already addressed it a little bit in that answer, but I guess like the topic of civil attacks in general would be good, I guess, for anyone that might not be aware of like what this means, like a civil attack. Um, of course, like, you know, crypto normally solves this, but I guess in Archway, um, has there been thought from any contributors or community about like how to prevent someone from just like taking the rewards themselves? I mean, it's, it's like a common, I guess, in any network, it's just... Like instead of the validators doing this themselves, like MEV or something like that, maybe it's like some person just sibling this application, like taking, and then maybe it's their application, so they take the rewards. Yeah, in a couple months here, we're going to um, start publishing a whole bunch of information on this in more specificity around, you know, the details of, you know, all the different possible civil attack entrances. Um, yeah, it, 
basically at the end of the day, the cost of signing the transaction has to be higher than the rewards that are received so that the cost of civil attacking the network is still much higher than what you would receive in terms of rewards distribution. Um, and we'll publish a whole bunch of papers on this uh, in the core team will uh, that will walk through like the different examples and use cases. Um, but yeah, that's ultimately the formula that we have to keep in mind that that the cost of signing a transaction has to be higher than uh, what you would receive as a reward. Just to expand on that. So the, the current state, the current design on the network. Uh, the way it works, there's there's three sources of rewards. There's gas transaction fees or gas. Yeah. There's inflation, and then there's a third optional fee, which we call contract premiums. So gas fees are split 50-50 between validators and DApps. The inflation is split 75-25 between validators and DApps. And then the contract premium is an entirely custom fee that's defined by the developer themselves. It's by default at zero, and if they want to add an additional premium and bake that into a single consolidated network fee, they're able to do that. Um, <coughs> And just yeah, to, to tie it back to Griffin's point, V1 is there's a max rewards cap of uh, more or less the total gas consumed on a given contract. So it's fundamentally unprofitable to spam transactions or spam contracts because you would be spending more than you'd be getting back in rewards. Um, that's that's the simplified V1, as Griffin kind of alluded to. We've been we've been diving deep on kind of the next iteration and the next version of that to make make that ceiling a little more dynamic um, and ensure ensure civil resistance while continuing to further incentivize DAP developers and and ultimately to allow them to capture a larger share of the inflationary rewards and not just be capped at, at total gas consumed on a given contract. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, maybe switching gears a bit. I think, right, Mike, you, you mentioned already uh, you're working on ecosystem. I think also like what you talked about Loom, right? Like we were also new validator, as you mentioned. And Loom was probably one of the best projects in terms of like developer uh, advocacy and like kind of getting people onto this thing. Um, now, Archway is kind of like essential of this, so super cool to see you on that too. And I guess the question would be, you know, how does Archway, I, I guess, of course, you have this incentive mechanism that tries to like get people to build there, but how else do you uh, contribute to like getting more people into that uh, ecosystem building on Archway? Are there like specific programs you guys are doing? What what kind of other plans you have? And maybe what, what kind of projects are already uh, working to to deploy on Archway, if you can share anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where do we start? There's there's tons in the works. Um, in addition to to the economic model, I think one one interesting angle that we're really focused on and, and spending a ton of time and effort is around Cosmosm itself. Cosmosm is extraordinary in in many ways, but the the Cosmosm ecosystem itself is relatively young. It's not entirely easy or straightforward for someone to go about building uh, a DAP atop a Cosmosm based base network today. And so <clears throat> we're doing a ton around the tooling, the, the base tooling um, that's kind of a given in and around other ecosystems, right? Like Griffin, um, you know, he's, he's got a background and like much of his experience at Consensus was building out some of this foundational tooling in the Ethereum ecosystem. Now trying to sort of replicate that for for Cosmos and within Cosmos broadly, and so <clears throat> things like IDEs, linters, plugins, doing a lot around educational resources. Again, it sounds like a given, but even just like the docs, reference implementations, base contract templates, like a lot of that's not not really there in the Cosmos ecosystem, and so um, <clears throat> just getting all those essentials in place to simplify the development workflow and, and help help coax more folks in, into the space um, and get them building a top Cosmosm and, and deploying a top arch today. Yeah. Uh, some other cool things we have in the works too that um, besides contributing to uh, WASMD in the core Cosmosm uh, library and a set of suite of libraries, um, we're also actively taking the charge on um, 
writing Golang-based smart contracts and compilers for that. Uh, so today, you won't be able to uh, just build your contracts just in Rust. Um, you know, by mainnet, you'll be able to write um, your smart contracts in a tiny Go uh, version of, of Golang, a simplified down version of it, and you'll be able to write and compile up your contracts uh, to WebAssembly and deploy them onto up at the network. So, um, you know, from our perspective, Rust as a programming language is really great at a low level, you know, but some of the challenges is around the adoption of the language and just getting a lot of developers familiarized with it and things like that. So, you know, our strategy is to do that. But in addition, um, you know, the community is actively working on, um, you know, supporting these these Golay space contracts, and as you guys know already, you know the Cosmos SDK is written in Golang. So for the longest time, even the core SDK devs, if they didn't know Rust, couldn't even build out their own DApps on top of Cosmos and right. And, and typically, those are two different skill sets. And so, um, you know, now this will give them an opportunity to basically start building out DApp layer based um, smart contracts that that maybe weren't previously possible because they weren't familiar with Rust as a programming language. So we're very excited to. Uh, um, yeah, support Golang uh, going forward for mainnet, and and then um, uh, you know we're evaluating definitely other programming languages where it makes sense. But uh, those are the two primary ones we'll be launching with. Yeah, I think that's uh, really interesting. I actually didn't even realize uh, Archway was doing that. I think I'm sure there'll be a lot of developers that are super happy to hear that because um, you're completely right. I guess Cosmosm is mainly Rust based, and then of course the modules in Cosmos are. You know, more Golang. So it'd be cool to sort of marry the two together and, you know, have a smart contracting network in general that, you know, provides to both Rust and to Go. And so I just like on the smart contract thing platforms, let's say, so Juno was like released like I think a few months ago now. And of course, without going too much into the drama, there's is like quite a controversial network, let's say. But they were doing some, like they wanted to be a smart contract network and like sort of similar, Archway wants to be a smart contract network. So a lot of Juno, in my opinion, where sometimes they had troubles was with governance and like what happened there. And for better or for worse, maybe it was the opposite where the governance was so good where it worked too well. So is there like anything in Archway, is it going to be like a governance heavy chain like Juno and, and like very passionate people on both sides or is it like a bit l less hands-on and more like, uh, like how ha have you thought about governance and would it be like very different to other smart contracting networks? Yeah, it's a little early right now. One thing we are considering is like setting up a governance structure that more runs like a democracy or a republic where you would basically nominate uh, selected individuals that would be active in making a lot of the voting-based decisions and things like that. Um, you know, we really do like the Juno community, believe it or not. We think the space is so big that there's there's a lot of opportunity for, um, you know, both platforms to succeed. Uh, but when we see a lot of the recent, like, governed stuff, not just on Juno, but broadly speaking, it's like there's this mob mentality, you know, everybody's trying to get tokens or things like that. And sometimes... Um, uh, the most informed individuals in an ecosystem, um, you know, really in a lot of ways probably should be, um, with the help of the community, helping to steer the ship a little bit more than, um, you know, just, just anybody. So what we've been thinking about to try to solve this problem and it's just some ideas at this point is like basically setting up like a Republic system where governance token, where uh, Archway token holders would be able to basically vote for you know a handful of series of representatives that then would be responsible for basically voting and turnout and things like that um, so we're still thinking through some of that stuff we don't know if that will solve you know all the most recent problems we've seen in governance over the last couple of months across a bunch of different chains but um, it is one idea that the community is talking about and discussing in the forums and and so we love, obviously, the rest of the community's feedback on that proposed structure, whether we think it's a good idea or not a good idea. But it's something we've been discussing as a community. Yeah, I would just add to another another interesting facet there that I'm personally keen to see play out is the fact that you know the, the economic model, of course, it's 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 exciting, it's interesting because it unlocks these new funding streams and monetization opportunities for for DApps and for developers and for their communities. Um, but something our, our friends at Figment pointed out a few weeks back, um, you know, th there's another dimension to it where they're also, you know, they're getting an ownership stake in the network. It's not just it's not just like pure cold hard revenue. Um, it's about 
aligning their interests at a deeper level um, and getting them a stake in the network and getting them participate participating in um, you know through other angles through other dimensions like governance and I think that looks a lot different than than your typical proof of stake chain. Yeah, and what else is cool is about this is like the dynamics of the token holder. So if, if most of the token rewards is going to DApp developers, it's DApp developers who are the community and that are controlling the direction and the community of the protocol. So it'll be some interesting different dynamics that might play out differently in other chains because ultimately it's like the developers that are going to be the primary driver drivers as to which way the community kind of goes on some of this stuff. So we're excited to see all these kinds of themes play out a little bit on this protocol versus some other protocols. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think, I guess the other side of that is also though that a lot of the developers might just want to sell the token to, uh, I guess there's also like a pressure, but of course you do have that with the validators and in, in, in any case with any kind of token holder too, it's just kind of. I guess one thing that just came to mind for me. Um, so we talked a lot about, I guess, a platform, uh, some theoretical things, how it works, uh, and and the use cases it covers. Maybe we can talk a little bit about, you know, where you guys are at right now um, in terms of the roadmap. What what are you working on right now? What's coming next? Um, how can people get involved? Things like that. Can you share a little bit about your plans there? Yeah, absolutely. So the um, the first incentivized testnet is running right now. Um, we recently wrapped up the validator proportion. We had like 14,000 submissions from validators all around the world wanting to validate on the network. So it was a really great turnout. Uh, but, you know, the... the uh, the program is still running right now. Um, there's opportunity to uh, apply and submit for all the other kinds of challenges, DAP submission challenges, tooling challenges, uh, content. Uh, so we really encourage the community to take a look at that. Um, in addition, um, so that this program will run up and then we'll run a second test net that will test the economic model a little bit more at a deeper level. Uh, and then, you know, we're, we're aiming for mainnet um, later this summer, early fall time for those that are um, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and so we're really, really excited for, um, yeah, just being able to get th this off, uh, uh, assuming that the community votes to basically launch the mainnet uh, later this fall, later this summer, fall, uh, we're excited for that. Uh, or extending that a little bit, right? So we've, we've also like the, the Archway DAP CLI is out there. The docs are up there. We've got tons of reference implementations, like I said, contract templates. And so, um, you know, it's fun that this first test net was a major milestone and just kind of a fun juncture in the life of the protocol because it's finally open and people are interacting and running the software and starting to build on top of it. And, um, and so, yeah, I, th I think, We'll continue building out all of those pieces, all of those elements, um, but people are building and we're looking for more builders. And yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's a huge focus for us as well. We definitely have a lot of chains running. So we have Titus, which is our experimental, Constantine, which is the stable environment for dApps. We have Augusta, which is a community network that the community is just running right now already, which is so exciting. And then Titus, which is the incentivized test net. So there's a bunch of different networks all designed to be testing different things with the protocol and just great opportunity to come in and start deploying and testing your dApps today. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much. I think with that, it's a great place to to leave off and I just wanted to thank you know both of you for your time today to explain you know Archway I think like Felix and I and everyone at Chorus One you know we're really excited to see Archway go live I mean you touched on some really critical um, things and little ingredients that you're adding with Archway that I think will impact the Cosmos ecosystem in such like a large way so yeah we're really excited to support you know Archway as well as all the contributors everyone else on, on, on the journey towards mainnet and yeah we wish you all the best as you prepare like towards the end of the incentivized testnet and uh, yeah look forward to hopefully having you on the show in a year or two's time when uh, we can talk about the successes of the network <laughs> wonderful thank you guys we really appreciate it thanks guys thanks so much Cheers, guys. See you.